We are gathered here this afternoon to think deeply about a very important question. What makes life worth living? We've asked our university, for university community to deliberate this oft asked question by making it the focus of this year's, this fall's theme semester in the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts. Maybe you've seen the t-shirts appearing around campus with a space left open for each person to add his or her own idea of what makes life worth living. Students and others have added the words hope, justice, competition, and possibility to create their personal statements. This afternoon, we will hear from Martin Seligman, the Zellerbach Family Professor of Psychology at the University of Pennsylvania, where he is director of the Positive Psychology Center. He will help each of us understand how important it is to ask this question, as well as to understand the answers. Throughout his career, Professor Seligman's work has been consistent with the goals of the Tanner Lecture, advancing knowledge of human values, then using that knowledge to improve the lives of others. Professor Seligman first made his mark in psychology by studying the darker side of the psyche with his focus on learned helplessness, which gave society a deeper understanding of the dynamics of depression. More recently, he has focused on the brighter side of psychology, conducting landmark research on optimism and how it can be encouraged. He is often called the father of positive psychology for shifting his focus from the extremely miserable to the extremely happy. In the past decade, Professor Seligman's primary mission has been the promotion of the field of positive psychology. His current mission is to transform social science to work on the best things in life, virtue, positive emotion, good relationships, and positive institutions institutions. The American Psychological Society has honored Professor Seligman's work with both the William James Award for Basic Science and the Cattell Award for the Application of Science. And the American Psychological Association has presented him with its Distinguished Scientific Contribution Award. He is the author of more than 20 books and 200 articles on motivation and personality. His latest work, to be released next April, is titled Flourish, A New Understanding of Life's Greatest Goals and What It Takes to Reach Them. Those of us in higher education are committed to the ideal that knowledge can be a powerful force for good and a core human value in its own right. Professor Seligman's career gives us all heart that this ideal and these commitments are not empty but that they can be very real indeed. Please join me in welcoming this year's Tanner Lecturer, Professor Martin Seligman. We have a strange heritage about the positive and negative sides of life. Uh, our heritage really comes from Schopenhauer and Freud. And it is, as many of you know, that the best we can ever hope for in life is to keep our misery and suffering to a minimum. I want to suggest today the, the possibility of a positive human future. I'm not predicting a positive human future, but in order for that to occur, the prologue is to outline the components of what it might be for human beings to have a positive human future, to flourish. Until the possibility that there are more possibilities in life than minimizing your suffering gets on the radar screen, a positive human future is impossible. So I'm going to try to say today what the components of the positive side of life might be that science can help us with and what we know about how those might be achieved. So uh, here's an outline of what I'm going to do in the next hour. Um, 
I, I've given you the prologue, and that's to say that if nothing else were to occur, but we merely began to think of our own lives, the lives of our university, the lives of our nation, in terms more than just going from minus five to zero, but going from plus two to plus five, that merely having that on the radar screen may do some good. And I'm then going to try to say what I mean about going from plus two to plus five. Um, so in order to do that, I'm going to talk about uh, what positive psychology is, uh, in my view. Um, and uh, I've had a, a change of theory, for those of you who are scholars about this, about uh, what positive psychology is and what well-being is. So I will take you through uh, my, my latest uh, change in belief uh, and talk about what is well-being. Uh, having uh, defined what I think it is for a human being, an organization or a nation to flourish, I'm going to ask the question, is the positive side of life buildable? Or is it like your waistline? So uh, you, you probably know that uh, dieting is a scam, uh, the $50 billion scam in the United States. And, and the reason for that is uh, that uh, any of you can lose 5% of your body weight in about three weeks by following any diet that's on the bestseller list now. The problem is that between 80 and 95% of you will regain all that weight or more in the next three to five years. I did the watermelon diet recently. I lost 20, 20 pounds. I had diarrhea for three weeks. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so the question about uh, the positive side of life, is it like so many things in which you can see temporary changes and then we revert? to our baseline, or is it actually movable? And I'm going to suggest to you that there is a building literature on positive interventions that suggests that what I am going to define in a moment as the positive side of life, PERMA, positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishment is actually buildable. It's not like your waistline. You can have more of those things in your life. Uh, and then I'm going to ask the question, given what we know about positive interventions, which comes almost entirely from uh, individuals, uh, I'll talk a bit about uh, these interventions in larger entities. So I'll talk about uh, positive intervention programs that we do in schools and school systems. And then uh, I'm going to talk about the entire United States Army, uh, in which uh, uh, the chief of staff decided two years ago uh, that he wanted to create an army that was just as psychologically fit as physically fit. And I'll tell you the, the story of this uh, massive cultural intervention which is ongoing. So I want to ask the question, uh, there's a fair amount of evidence that positive interventions work in individuals. Uh, there's beginning evidence it works uh, in organizations, and by the way, Michigan is the home of, uh, I think, the, the best work on this positive organizational scholarship. And then I'm going to ask the question, um, can this happen in nations, and can it happen globally? Can it happen to the world? Can there be a better positive human future? And in this context, I'm going to suggest to you that the wealthy nations of the world uh, stand at a very special moment in history. I'm going to call it a Florentine moment uh, in which there are some decisions we have to make about what wealth is for. So that's uh, the sum of what I want to talk about in the next uh, 50 minutes or so. So uh, this is a slide I've stolen from Chris Peterson. Uh, Chris has been my colleague for 31 years. Uh, in many ways, he's more the founder of positive psychology than I am. And he, he does comb the internet looking for cute pictures. So, uh, uh, so the question of what is positive psychology? Well, uh, positive uh, psychology in my own life and historically has been about what's, what's wrong with life. Uh, about suicide, depression, substance abuse, schizophrenia, uh, victims, and all the awful brick walls that uh, can fall on you. 
And uh, my own intellectual history uh, partook of that. As uh, your president mentioned, I started out working on learned helplessness and uh, asked the question, uh, when animals and people face uh, bad events that they can't do anything about, what happens? And a literature grew up in which we found that uh, people uh, who experienced uncontrollable bad events uh, became passive, they didn't try to do anything about their future, and they had cognitive troubles. They had trouble seeing that their um, actions worked and succeeded when they really did. They became an individual culture of failure. Uh, but in the helplessness literature, there was uh, for 10 years a regularity that I uh, uh, minimized, and that was a third of the people who came to my laboratory and we gave inescapable puzzles to or inescapable noise never became helpless. So about 35 years ago, we began to ask the question, what is it about some people that makes them immune from helplessness? And what is it about other people, one-tenth of people would come to my laboratory, didn't need to do anything, they would just collapse. Uh, what is it about other people who become helpless at the drop of a hat? And it turned out that the key to this was um, uh, optimism. So uh, when we began to ask of people who experienced in the laboratory and in real life uh, awful events, uh, those people whose habitual way of looking at setback in life was tragic. That is, it's going to last forever, it's going to undermine everything I do, and there's nothing I can do about it, were the people who collapsed and collapsed readily. The people who we couldn't make helpless, by and large, were people who, when bad events occurred to them, had the habit of mind of saying, uh, it's temporary, it's just this one situation, and there's something I can do about it. So that was what we called learned optimism. And uh, uh, about uh, uh, 13 years ago, when I was president of the American Psychological Association, my job was to look around at what psychology did well and what it did badly. And uh, what psychology did well was misery and suffering. And what it, it didn't do uh, very well was what made life worth living. And so it, it was with that in mind that I gathered together under one large tent um, uh, some of the leading people like Chris Peterson, Barbara Fredrickson, who uh, worked on the positive side of life and tried to uh, create a field uh, in which uh, we ask the question, what makes life worth living? How can we build it? So in this framework, uh, psychology should be just as concerned with strength as it is with weakness. Uh, it should be just as interested in building uh, what makes life worth living as it is with, with repairing pathology. Oh, and by the way, I hasten to say for, the, for those of you who do uh, clinical things, I am not remotely suggesting th this as a replacement for psychology as usual. I spent all of my life uh, working on misery and suffering, and I think we've learned something about it and, and how to uh, uh, lower the amount of it there is on the planet. This is a supplement. This suggests that literally just working in the Schopenhauer-Freud framework of the best you can do is relieve misery is literally half-baked. Uh, it misses that there's an entire other side of life in which, uh, which you experience. Most of you, when you go to bed at night, you're not thinking about how to go from minus eight to minus three in life. By and large, you're thinking about how to go from plus three to plus six. So this says that in addition to understanding uh, suffering, we need to understand how to go from plus two to plus six. So this is a supplement to what uh, psychology traditionally does. Uh, that we should be just as concerned with making the lives of people like you fulfilling as we are with healing pathology. Uh, and finally, um, just as we, we spent so much time in pharmacology and in psychotherapy developing interventions that relieve misery 
Uh, those are not the same thing as interventions that produce well-being. So just a couple of ways of thinking that. So I'm making the claim that removing the disabling conditions of life is laudable, but that's not the same endeavor as building the enabling conditions of life. So uh, I am a psychotherapist. Um, I'm, by the way, not all that good a psychotherapist. I'm better at talking than I am at listening. Uh, but I've trained a lot of good psychotherapists. And once in a while, I would do pretty good work. And I would get rid of almost all of her sadness, her anxiety, her anger. And I thought I'd get a happy person, but I never did. What I got was an empty person. And that's because building the skills of having better relationships, more meaning in life, uh, engagement, positive emotion, is in, almost entirely different from building the skills of fighting depression, anxiety, and anger. Uh, so what we want to do is develop interventions that build the enabling conditions of life, not just interventions to decrease misery. So let me take you through my, my intellectual trip uh, about uh, well-being for, for uh, the scholars in the audience. Uh, about 10 years ago, I wrote a book called Authentic Happiness, in which I asked the question, what were the components of well-being? Well, actually, the question was, what is happiness? Uh, and I argued that happiness, which is a word, by the way, that uh, I, it's almost useless, uh, used in so many different ways, that the study of happiness could be displaced by studying positive emotion, engagement, when time stops for you, when you're one with the music. Uh, so looking around, I can only see the first 10 rows, but looking around, it looks to me like about 60% of you are totally absorbed in what I'm saying. You're <laughs> one with the music. The other 40% of you are having sexual fantasies, by the way, <laughs> well documented. Um, so the first form of happiness in this was positive emotion. The second was being absorbed, engagement. And the third was having meaning in life, uh, 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 belonging to and serving something that you believed was bigger than you were. So that was the, the theory, and, and a lot of research was done on that. And starting about four years ago, uh, I began to change my mind about that uh, in the following way. Uh, the first thing was that um, I had thought that the topic of positive psychology was actually a real thing, happiness. And the surrogate variable, the proxy for measuring it, was life satisfaction. Um, I wasn't very happy about that because, as uh, uh, Ruth Wienhoven has shown, when you ask people's life satisfaction, 70% of their answer is what mood they happen to be in, and about 30% is what judgment they make about the conditions of their life. I didn't want a happyology, so I didn't want a psychology that was just about what mood you happen to be in. So that was, began to wonder about the target of positive psychology, which I am now going to call well-being or flourishing. And then the second thing was the ingredients. So uh, I began to be convinced that uh, positive emotion, engagement, and meaning did not exhaust the things that many people did for their own sake. And uh, so to be an element in this theory of well-being uh, is to have, there are five different elements, uh, uh, positive emotion, which is the old one, engagement, which I just described. The third was relationships, positive relationships. So I've come to believe that people are motivated to seek out and maintain positive relationships, even if it brings none of the other elements. Now, it's very important to understand this last phrase, none of the other elements. It is often commonly said that uh, when we do things like play tennis, we do it because it makes us happy. We read a book because it makes us happy. Uh, I think that's a reification. And what I want to say is that happiness is often invoked post hoc, and it's not present. So interestingly, if uh, uh, you look actually totally engaged in what I'm saying, if I 
beeped you now, as my cheek sent me high does, and asked you what you were thinking and feeling, you would say nothing 80% of the time. That we actually believe that the cognitive and emotional resources necessary to be totally engaged parasitize and you are, use up all cognitive and emotional resources. So being one with the music, we think, is not, it's only, you're only happy in retrospect, not during. So each of these elements in this view uh, is something that a large number of people do for it, their own sake. Third is positive relationships. Uh, the fourth is meaning, belonging to, and serving something that you think is uh, bigger than you are. And the fifth, which I've been dragged kicking and screaming into, is accomplishment. That is, I think many people are motivated to achieve, to have mastery, to have competence, even if it brings no positive emotion, no engagement, no relationships, and no meaning. Uh, I'll just tell you briefly what's convinced me about that. So as some of you know, I'm a very serious bridge player. And in fact, uh, tomorrow I'm getting on an airplane to get home in time to play in the World Championships, which happen to be in Philadelphia on Saturday. And so uh, I'm not all that good a bridge player. I play with the great bridge players. I'm their student. Uh, but uh, great bridge players divide into two categories, those people who uh, when they play, are engaged, they're happy, uh, and those people who just play to win. And among them are cheaters. So people actually cheat at high level bridge in order just to win. And I think the same thing is true uh, in the financial word, world as well. So I've become convinced that uh, uh, accomplishment is a fifth element. Uh, and so what I want to say, and I'll, I'll repeat it as we talk about organizations and nations, that to flourish, to have well-being, is to have these five elements in life. And notice that they're different from not being depressed and not being anxious and not being angry. And uh, uh, I'm interested in this in individuals, and I'll go through a little bit of the data. Uh, so in general, uh, we find that uh, uh, the usual route in clinical psychology with depression is to try to hit it head on, and there are techniques which are depression fighting in their own right. But there is reason to believe that if you build these states, that that's an end run around depression. And uh, there is something uh, called positive psychotherapy, which exists and incorporates uh, 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 different elements of uh, this into it. Uh, and um, so I want to talk about uh, the building of these things and, and the correlations. Um, so let me talk about uh, a state that I've worked on a lot of my life, optimism, and what its effect is in uh, uh, depression, achievement, and physical health. Uh, just as an example of the kind of thing that goes on in positive psychology. So with Chris Peterson, 30 years ago, we started to measure optimistic versus pessimistic people. And uh, our definition, as I said, was optimistic people were people who uh, viewed setbacks as temporary, changeable, and just this one situation. Uh, and we started to follow them across time. And when we compared optimists and pessimists, we found that holding depression constant at time one, uh, pessimistic people, when they face setbacks, got depressed at two to eight times the rate of optimistic people. We then asked the question, well, what is the effect of optimism on uh, uh, achievement? And uh, this has been done in uh, uh, school, in the business world, in sports. This is a, a school example. And by the way, it's important uh, that the form of this large literature, probably two to 500 articles, is you take people's optimism or pessimism at time one, and you take their talents at time one, and then you ask, can you predict increases or decreases in the target variable? So this is something that uh, uh, comes from uh, Penn. I think it's been done at West Point, and I think maybe at Michigan as well. Uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, what the admissions committee does is, uh, uh, is to take your uh, kids' uh, SATs, 
uh, high school grade point average, their achievement test, grinds them into a regression equation, and a number spits out like 3.3. That's your child's predicted grade point average for their freshman year. And uh, legacy and athletics aside, a lot of admission is done based on that number. So the dean of admissions had come to me and said, Marty, we're making a lot of mistakes uh, in admissions at Penn. Uh, we find there are a large number of kids who do much better than they're supposed to do, given their SATs, their high school grade point average, and a smaller number who do much worse. Uh, can you predict who's going to do it? So uh, what we did in this study was the first day at the University of Pennsylvania, we gave them the optimism pessimism test that well over a million people have taken now. Uh, and then we just watched them for the first semester. And we found that 83 of the kids did uh, one and a half standard deviations better than they were supposed to do given their talents. Uh, only 17 did one and a half standard deviations worse. Uh, that's about getting A minus instead of a C plus or vice versa. And it was the pessimists who did worse than they were supposed to and the optimists who did better. Uh, uh, around the same time, uh, the coach of America's uh, Olympic team, North Thornton, uh, this is the Seoul Olympics in 1988, uh, wanted to know who to put in the relay races. So uh, you probably know that in, in uh, high level swimming, all, all level swimming, the relay races occur after individual events. So the question is, if a great swimmer does badly, should you put that swimmer in the relays or will they collapse? And so uh, we measured the optimism and pessimism of all of America's male and female Olympic swimmers. And uh, uh, here's what we did with Matt Biondi. We did it with all the swimmers. North said, Matt, into the pool, swim the 100 fly. And Biondi swam it in uh, 50.2, I think. And he came out of the pool. And, and North said, Matt, 52.5. Uh, so it, we lied to them, terrible score, terrible swimming. And the question was, rest up for 20 minutes, Matt, and swim it again. So Biondi swam it the second time in 49.9. So he's in the top 25% of professional athletes. What we find in Major League Baseball, in NBA basketball, in Olympic swimming, is that optimistic athletes get better after defeat. Pessimistic athletes get slower. And uh, as you can see, this was the finding with our uh, uh, Olympic swimmers. Uh, so to, to uh, I'm not going to have time to talk about the third optimism domain, which I spend a lot of my time working on, the relationship of optimism to cardiovascular health. Uh, just let me try to summarize that by saying there are about 15 well-done studies in which for example, you take the optimism and pessimism of 65-year-old Dutch men and women, and then you follow them for a decade, in this case, 999 of them. 35% uh, uh, 35, uh, of them, 10 years later, are dead of uh, cardiovascular complications. Uh, and you ask the question, can you predict who's going to make it from 65 to 75, given all the traditional risk factors like uh, cholesterol, blood pressure, uh, BMI, and the like? And what, what, what you find is that these risk factors aren't very predictive, but if you take the optimism or pessimism uh, holding constant uh, the risk factors, that is, you would take psychological health assets, the upper quartile in optimism has uh, uh, better than half the risk of cardiovascular death than the rest of the population. And there are about 15 such studies in the literature. So the theory we're working with here uh, and uh, the, uh, is this one, that uh, positive psychology is about the concept of well-being. And I made this, I finally changed my mind and put in engagement. It still works with PERMA. And the pillars of uh, well-being are positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning and accomplishment. And what Chris Peterson and I have worked on for the last 15 years or so, strengths and virtues we see as something that contributes to all of those components. So what I've done in the first uh, uh, 20 minutes is to uh, define the field. I've said it's the study of PERMA. Uh, and I've given you 
some samples of a, a large amount of science that's been done on positive emotions, engagement, meaning, relationships, and accomplishment. So what I want to turn to now is the question of uh, can these things change? And what do we know about whether you can build these things? So I uh, should describe how a lot of these interventions begin. Uh, I'm a naughty thumb of science person. Uh, uh, typically with a positive intervention, uh, when someone suggests it to me, I, oh, I should tell you, by the way, I'm a pessimist and a depressive. Uh, and I, I think actually only a pessimist can do serious scientific work on optimism. Um, uh, and I take my own medicine. So when uh, one of my undergraduates suggested to me uh, 10 years ago that making a gratitude visit might be something that increased positive emotion or increased relationships, I first did it on myself. If it works on me, uh, oh, I should tell you more generally, in sort of my whole life exp as a psychologist, I've always uh, taken whatever my subjects took. So when I did shock in animals, I would take the shock first, and I'd eat the Purina dog chow, and uh, uh, which was worse than the shock, I should tell you, for many of you who have done that. Um, and uh, so I first do these interventions on myself. If it works on me, uh, I give it to my wife and seven children. Uh, <laughs> If it works on them, uh, then my graduate students get it, and we begin to do laboratory studies on it. And then if it works in laboratory studies, we begin to do uh, clinical population studies. So what I'm going to tell you now about is I've spent some of my career, uh, there's a, a methodology for testing interventions on the negative side of life, which is a random assignment placebo-controlled studies. And I had done that with uh, psychotherapy studies and, and with drug studies. And uh, so uh, when I began uh, a decade ago to work on positive interventions, I asked, could you do the same thing on happiness interventions, on positive interventions? That is, you could ask in a rigorous way whether or not a given intervention uh, in a random assignment placebo-controlled procedure actually made people lastingly less depressed. So we asked, could you, uh, from the Buddha to modern pop psychology, there have been about 200 suggestions about what makes people lastingly happier, what produces well-being. So what we do in real life in my laboratory is we take these different suggestions, we manualize them, put them up on the web. Oh, I should tell you about that. So I have a website called uh, AuthenticHappiness.org. About 1.76 million people have registered at it and taken the test. It's got free all the basic tests of the positive side of life. But every so often, uh, we would put up a link which said exercises. And uh, if you went to that link, it said something like, Dr. Seligman would like to find out what exercises make people lastingly happier and less depressed, and what are placebos. So if you're willing to do this, uh, you're going to get an exercise. You're not going to know whether or not it's a placebo or a real exercise. And then we're going to follow you for the next six months, uh, asking your depression and well-being. Uh, so uh, that's typical of the methodology that we used. Uh, and let me tell you something about the exercises that uh, in this procedure we found out uh, work and work uh, lastingly well. So we measure people out to six months versus placebo. So is it clear the procedures we're using here? Okay, so you come to the website and you might get an exercise uh, which says, um, every night for uh, the next week, before you go to sleep, write down three things that went well today and why they went well. Uh, and it turns out, when you do this compared to placebo, uh, six months later, people who do this are less depressed and have uh, higher uh, positive emotion. Six months later. Uh, they just supposed to do it for a week, and this is a, a important. 
Um, from the first day I took up skiing till five years later when I quit, I was always fighting the mountain. And those of, how many of you are psychotherapists, do psychotherapy? Okay, well, those of you who do psychotherapy probably know that when you're working on people's weaknesses, you're always fighting the mountain. And one of the dirty little secrets of psychotherapy research is the way we measure its effectiveness is how long the effects last after the end of treatment before they melt to zero. So by and large, psychotherapy, sad to say, like dieting, uh, uh, in general, you get effects for a few months and then it melts to zero. Uh, interestingly, one characteristic of many of the positive exercises is they're self-reinforcing, they're self-sustaining. Uh, so unlike dieting, uh, in which it's no fun to keep turning down chocolate mousse, when you start uh, writing down three things that went well today and why they went well, uh, you tend to sleep better. You don't go to sleep at night thinking about uh, the fight you just had with your dean. Uh, and uh, people keep doing it, by and large, after the week is up. So these tend to be addictive and self-maintaining. And uh, so that's important. So that's one exercise that's quite well documented. Uh, second, I was talking to your president about, uh, uh, I don't think I brought the slide for this, but you can imagine it. Um, any of you marriage counselors? No, well, that's good. Uh, 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 marital therapy is the most difficult form of therapy to do. Uh, it has the worst outcome statistics. People are lying to each other. They're, they're lying to you. Uh, does, uh, uh, and uh, sometimes they uh, join in an alliance against you and then things go better. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, basically in marital therapy, what we teach people to do is how to fight better, not to have the same fight over and over again. So what you're trying to do essentially is change uh, insufferable marriages into barely tolerable marriages. <laughs> uh, now that's not what positive psychology is interested in. Uh, and uh, so about seven years ago, a group of marital researchers at UCLA began to ask the question, uh, not how couples fight together as a predictor of divorce, but how they celebrate together. And uh, so you have to imagine now a two by two table. Your spouse comes home and she's just been promoted at work. Something, she reports something very good to you. What do you say to her? So imagine a two by two table, which is active, passive, constructive, destructive. Okay, so um, you might do active, destructive, which is uh, uh, you've been promoted, you know what tax bracket that's gonna put us into? Um, you might do, and this is what I did till I read the literature, so this is, uh, by the way, I have a list of 20 surprising things that I didn't know 10 years ago that the science of positive psychology has told us about. This is one of them, an uh, important one for your own life. Uh, what I used to do is just say congratulations, well deserved. Uh, you m might do passive destructive, which is what's for dinner. Uh, the only one that works is active constructive, and that is, um, uh, uh, where were you when your boss told you you, you had been promoted? Uh, exactly what did he say uh, verbatim? Um, uh, why do you really think you've been promoted? And you know, I've been reading your financial reports for the last few months, and that last report you wrote on the pension plan is simply the best uh, financial document I've read in my 25 years in business. Now, would you relive the whole episode with me? So it, that's active, constructive responding. It turns out when you do that, that predicts increases in love, affection, and decreases in divorce. Uh, so that's the second one that's quite well documented now, uh, uh, active constructive responding. Uh, third one, uh, this is something that came out of the work that Chris Peterson and I did, was if this was an overnight 
if we're doing two things. Uh, I would have you tonight go to authentichappiness.org and take the signature strengths test. And wait, basically, this is a test that over a, a million people have taken. It tells you what your five highest strengths are, fairness, kindness, social intelligence, sense of humor, and the like. And then your assignment would be, uh, once you had your signature strength, we'll do, do half of it together right now. So close your eyes. Think of something that you have to do at school or at work every week that you don't like doing. Okay, open your eyes. Now, the signature strengths exercise says, given that you found out your highest signature strength, think of a way of doing that task using your highest strength. So let me just put a little flesh on what that might mean. Uh, so uh, one woman I worked with was a waitress, and she hated waitressing, heavy trays, and she was working her way through graduate school. Customers patronized her, and her highest strength was social intelligence. So her, her task was to redefine waitressing using her highest strength. So she decided that she would make the encounter with her the social highlight of every customer's evening. Now, notice a couple of things about that. One, she's gonna fail at that almost all the time. But secondly, she is continually putting on offer what she's best at. And what you find when people do that is, in her case, the trays got lighter and the tips got bigger. But uh, in the case of uh, random assignment placebo-controlled research, uh, when you have that assignment to do just for one week, six months later, you are uh, less depressed and happier. Um, so uh, that's a, a flavor of, of, of what, what's done in interventions. There are about 12 well-documented interventions now uh, that work. Uh, so we had done this in individuals, and a pretty large literature uh, grew up over this. Uh, so we began to ask the question, could you do this in organizations? And uh, so we began with schools and kids, and we went to uh, 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 classrooms, and we would teach individual uh, uh, classes uh, techniques of the sort that I've described here. Uh, and we, we found in uh, several studies that when we taught 10 to 12 year old kids the techniques of positive psychology and of resilience, and then we followed them versus control groups through puberty, we roughly halved the rate of depression and anxiety when the kids went through puberty. Uh, and then we asked, what the, so that was done by my graduate students. And then we asked the question, well, you can't disseminate this if it's just my graduate students. Could we teach teachers to do this? So we developed a, a 10-day course for teachers. And uh, we began to do large groups of teachers. And then we would follow the students of the teachers for the next two years. And again, we found that if we taught the teachers the techniques of resilience and positive psychology that their students for the next two years showed significantly less depression, less anxiety, and better conduct. Uh, and uh, one, of, one of the really neat experiences in my life uh, was uh, 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 the Geelong Grammar School in Australia came to me. This is, a tradi this is the Eton of Australia, traditional British uh, academy. Uh, and they said, take our whole school and do the whole school. So we, we, a couple of years ago, I took my 20 of my faculty to Australia. Uh, we took the uh, 100 faculty from Geelong Grammar, 1,200 students. Uh, they gave up their summer vacation, 10 days of it, uh, to learn these techniques. And uh, uh, we've, uh, uh, the whole school has now been imbued with positive education. Uh, so, uh, uh, indeed, this was going on in schools, and there are now, uh, last count, 21 replications of these procedures uh, in schools across the world. Uh, America, Australia, Beijing, uh, to name some. Uh, and I mentioned positive organizational scholarship, uh, and Michigan is one of the homes of this for organizations. Well, here's the story of the inflection point in positive education. 
So uh, two years ago, I was called uh, to the Pentagon, uh, and the Chief of Staff of the Army, George Casey, uh, had a luncheon, uh, and he began the luncheon by saying, post-traumatic stress disorder, suicide, depression, substance abuse, divorce. Well, what does positive psychology say about that, Dr. Seligman? Uh, and I said, uh, sir, uh, that the, what we know about, um, this is the entire general staff, uh, what we know about uh, the effect of extreme adversity on human beings is that the reaction is Gaussian, bell-shaped. And on the uh, far left-hand side, you have people who fall apart under extreme adversity. They become helpless. Uh, they show, depending on the era, what you're calling post-traumatic stress disorder. They kill themselves. They show depression. In the great middle are most people, by definition. These are people who are resilient, where what resilient means operationally is that they have a very hard time for a couple of weeks after the awful event. Uh, but within a month or two, by all our psychological and physical measures, they're back where they were. And then a large number of people on the right-hand side of the distribution show uh, post-traumatic growth. Uh, that is, they very often go through post-traumatic stress disorder, but uh, a year later, by our physical and psychological measures, they're stronger than they were uh, before the adversity occurred. These are the people that uh, Nietzsche said, if it doesn't kill me, it makes me stronger. Uh, and my suggestion, sir, is that you move the entire distribution of the army in the direction of post-traumatic growth by teaching them the skills. And General Casey uh, actually then did something that uh, Mary said, we, we can't do. He actually ordered, uh, we have to coax people to do things. I watched him order the United States Army and the general staff. From this day forward, resilience and positive psychology will be taught and measured throughout the entire United States Army. He, so he said to me, the general staff has read your work on positive education, and we like your model. Uh, that is, we like the notion that um, uh, you teach teachers these skills, and then the teachers teach the students. Well, that's the Army model. And I said, it is? He said, yeah, we have 40,000 teachers in the Army. I said, you do? He says, yeah, the drill sergeants. <laughs> so he said, your job, Dr. Seligman, will be to train all the drill sergeants <laughs> in the Army in positive psychology. And indeed, uh, 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 this is indeed what the United States Army is doing. There have been two stages in this. Uh, the first, Chris Peterson, uh, developed with Carl Castro a test of fitnesses. Your usual army test is weaknesses and risk factors. But what Chris developed was a 120 item test of psychological fitness, social fitness, uh, family fitness, and spiritual fitness. So we have the positive variables on 1.1 million soldiers. And indeed, the Army has now developed online courses that you can take for credit if you're doing badly in this area. And then the second part, which is what I'm intimately involved in, is every month 150 drill sergeants come to the University of Pennsylvania, and we take them through uh, the entire teaching manual, and they go out and teach the troops. Uh, so uh, we're in the middle of a, 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 a cultural transformation in which uh, uh, George Casey, who is a visionary, uh, uh, I think ha realizes that the wars that we've been involved in lately are human wars. They're not mechanical wars. And if you want to create an army that can do its job and not have post-traumatic stress disorder, you need a psychologically fit army. So psychological fitness has now been elevated to the same level as physical fitness in the United States Army. So uh, that's the uh, uh, largest organization we've worked with. This is uh, uh, what I mentioned to you 
Uh, this is in schools. Uh, if you look at, these are middle schoolers. Uh, you look at the cumulative uh, uh, depression, anxiety, and conduct problems in the control versus those who have been through these programs, and that's typical of what you see. Uh, so, uh, how about nations? Is it possible that uh, uh, an entire nation could flourish? Well, I don't know about that, but I think policy follows from what we measure. And right now, what we measure uh, is essentially economic. Uh, so, um, uh, well, I'll just tell you the, the British story. Uh, uh, in February, uh, I, the Tory leadership had me uh, over to England uh, a couple of months before the election, and they kind of, uh, David Cameron had been running on uh, uh, arguing that we should measure and do policy in Great Britain, not just around GDP, but around general well-being. So this was to get my advice about what that meant. And so I said, uh, uh, if, you're, if you should be elected, uh, you should take seriously the measurement of well-being in Britain, in addition to economic measures, uh, and hold yourself accountable for increases in well-being. Uh, and uh, form the equivalent of our Bureau of Labor Statistics, but not just about unemployment, uh, in which they already do and the like, but about PERMA, about how much positive emotion, how much engagement, how good relationships are, how much meaning, and how much accomplishment uh, the British people have. And indeed, uh, they were elected. Last week, I was at uh, number at uh, the Prime Minister's. Uh, so that's, uh, I, if three of us get into the taxi in London and I say to my colleagues, hold on, this is gonna be the great moment of my life. Uh, let me do it. So I say to the cab driver, number 10, please. And the cab driver says, number 10 what? <laughs> so that's, but it, at any rate, uh, the uh, 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 Cameron's government is taking this uh, uh, seriously as m measurement issue. And uh, here's some data from the Cambridge uh, Wellbeing Center. Uh, so uh, this is by criteria similar to mine. This is a survey of uh, about 50,000 adults in 23 European Union nations on the question, what percent are flourishing of the adult population in these nations by criteria very similar to PERMA. Uh, these are just subjective criteria in this survey. I mentioned parenthetically uh, that like Ruth uh, Weinhoven, I'm very interested in combining objective and subjective measures of positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishment. And uh, uh, this in many ways tells you it's uh, measurable. So what you see here is the percentage of adults in 23 European Union nations that are flourishing. So Denmark, as we always find is leading the pack with about 33% of adults flourishing. Uh, Britain uh, had about 18%, here it is over here, and uh, Russia about 6%, so huge gaps in flourishing. But what this basically tells us is that this concept of human flourishing is measurable. Uh, and one can ask the question, uh, when you do policy, uh, do you um, increase it? And you can hold yourself accountable. Uh, I wrote a memo to the prime minister that said, uh, it's not the economy, stupid. Uh, and what it basically said was that, you know, as naive as I am about economics, I think the best uh, the conservative government will do in Britain is to stop the hemorrhaging. But uh, I don't think people, uh, I don't think that will get you reelected and or make you a hero. You have to change the criteria by which government is judged from making the nation wealthier to increasing well-being. That's commonly said in the United States and Britain that this generation of young people will be the first generation not as well off as its parents. And that may be true economically, but it's not true of flourishing. So there's great dissociation between PERMA and economics, and I could spend the whole hour talking about that. And so I said, we well, want to change the criteria of good government from 
being not only about increasing wealth, but to increasing well-being. And so that, that leads to uh, the moonshot for positive psychology. Uh, uh, what is it that we might set out to do? And that's the notion that in the year uh, 2051, 51% of the world's population will be flourishing by the criteria I'm talking about. Um, that means that uh, a given amount of positive emotion, a given amount of engagement, a given amount of relationships, a given amount of meaning, and a given amount of accomplishment. Now, I should say that uh, uh, a lot of people work on measuring these things. There are door-to-door -door surveys and the like. Uh, but one of the most exciting potential collaborations we're engaged in is each of these five notions has a lexicon. So it turns out there are about 80 positive emotion words in English. And same thing is true for all five of those. There is also Buzz and Twitter. That is, you can look at frequency of these. And I was with the Google people uh, two weeks ago, and there's Google Earth. So what we intend to do, I hope the collaboration comes off, is to combine Buzz and Twitter, the use of the lexicon with Google Earth to measure in space and in time what, what percentage of uh, the world's population is uh, flourishing. One of the Google people did it overnight for the words happy and sad for every day in August in the Bay Area. So we're able to map the Bay Area. So it's, it's pretty readily doable. So I think this is measurable and inexpensively measurable. Now, the reason I think this is a serious human goal uh, is not just that I think that we want people smiling and having good relationships and having meaning in life, but the evidence in the positive psychology scientific literature is that the downstream effects of being of flourishing are at least three. People who are flourishing in general are physically healthier, uh, they're more productive at work, and they're more peaceful than people who are not flourishing. So the suggestion here is that some of the human goals we most cherish, which we've not been able to do much about head on, might be done by an end run of building flourishing. So this brings me to my concluding comments. Um, that's a picture of uh, Cosimo the Elder in about 1451 uh, in, in Florence. Uh, uh, so I want to talk about the, the politics of flourishing. It does have a politics. It's not, by the way, a politics of left or right, which is a generally a politics of means versus end. Uh, this is a politics of a different end. Uh, it says that left and right, as I in, take it, is individual versus uh, government uh, and their role in producing economic growth, military conquest, and those ends. So in this politics, the end is human flourishing, that what government is about in this view is increasing human flourishing. Uh, 1451 in, in Florence, uh, uh, when nations are poor and at war, in famine and in plague, it is perfectly natural that their primary concern should be defense and damage. And that is most of the history of uh, uh, the Earth. But there have been a number of occasions when nations were wealthy and at peace and not in civil turmoil and not in plague and not in famine. And uh, uh, 1451, 600 years from the date I'm proposing, uh, was one such time in Florence. So the Florence had become enormously wealthy by the 1450s uh, due to Medici banking genius for the most part. And it asked the question, what are we going to do with our surplus? What are we going to do with our wealth? And the generals said, well, let's conquer the peninsula which they probably could have done. But uh, Cosimo the Elder won the day. The, the debates are in the record. And Florence decided to devote its resources and its surplus to beauty, to beauty. Uh, they gave us what 
200 years later we called the Renaissance. Now I'm not suggesting that our, our time has come to go out and do sculpture. Rather, I'm suggesting that we are at a Florentine moment, that uh, by and large, the European Union, the United States, uh, the rich nations of the world uh, have come to a Florentine point. And the question is, what are we going to do? What are we going to do with this? What is, what is wealth about? Uh, so uh, my economist friends generally say that the point of GDP and wealth is to increase wealth. Well, as you can see, I'm arguing that the point of increasing wealth is to increase well-being, that the point of increasing wealth is to increase the PERMA in the citizens of the nation. I've suggested to you this is measurable. Uh, I've suggested to you that we know something about some of the interventions uh, that produce more of PERMA. Uh, and I, I want to end by talking about Nietzsche's uh, uh, three uh, stages in Zarathustra. Uh, I don't know if Nietzsche's in fashion and philosophy at all, uh, but uh, uh, as those of you who read Nietzsche know, uh, Nietzsche argued that human development divided into three stages. So the first stage he called the camel. So the camel, and he basically said that this is what human history for the most part has been about, just sits there and moans. Uh, the second stage Nietzsche called uh, the lion, sometimes the rebel. And what the lion did was to say no. Uh, no to poverty, no to racism, no to disease. And uh, we can reckon, that's what our politics since at least 1776 and maybe before has been. It's been the politics of saying no to the disabling conditions of life. And I think you have to be blinded by ideology not to see that this politics has been working, that there's more, demo you name it, there's more of the good things in the world now than there was 200 years ago. Uh, there's uh, not only more wealth, uh, but there's uh, less racism, less pollution, uh, uh, more human rights, more democracy, on and on, you name it. I, I think you actually have to be blinded by ideology not to see that there has been human progress. But that's not what Nietzsche was about. Nietzsche then says, what if the rebel, what if the lion worked? And we actually were reasonably successful about saying no to the disabling conditions of life. Nietzsche says there's a third stage of human existence called, he called it the child reborn, and in which he says, what, what can we say yes to? What can every human being affirm? What does every parent want for every child? And I think that's what we've talked about today, what every human being can say yes to. So I believe uh, that we can all say yes to more positive emotion in life, we can all say yes to more engagement with the people we love at work, in our leisure. We can all say yes to better relationships with people. We can all say yes to more meaning in life. And we can all say yes to more positive accomplishment. So uh, the vision I want to present to you uh, in summary is that psychology has made a turn from working not only on the disabling conditions of life, but the enabling conditions of life, uh, PERMA, the positive side of life. I've suggested to you it's measurable, uh, validly and reliably measurable, and I've suggested to you we, we've begun to find out the things that build it. And I want to conclude by suggesting to you that uh, a worthy future, our Florentine moment, is to build flourishing across the globe. Thank you. Uh, could, we, could we turn the house lights up? What can be done to inspire Carl Arove so that he will take up your call? and do what we need for PERMA to come about throughout not only our, our country, but the rest of the world? I, I think I understand your question. Uh, so um, 
what I've argued, Dave, this afternoon was that you can measure PERMA and flourishing and you can build it. But the question is, uh, can this be on the political agenda? So interestingly, it's, it's very much on the British political agenda at the moment. It's on the Australian political agenda, but it's not really on the American political agenda. So there's an empirical study that Kathleen Hall Jameson and I are in, engaged in. Some of you might consider it a bit Machiavellian, but I actually think of it as basic to the democratic process. So because of Chris Peterson's work and because uh, 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 1.7 million people have taken the tests on AuthenticHappiness.org. Uh, we have, for virtually every zip code in America, uh, well-being measures. Uh, and because it's a huge number of people, we have them over time. We also have, in other data sets, the income of every zip code in America. Okay, that's two of the components. Uh, Kathleen Hall Jameson, my colleague at Penn, uh, has very accessible the voting records of every zip code in America. So Dave, it's a fairly easy statistical matter uh, to ask the question, do people, particularly in a stagnant economy like ours, vote their income or their changes in income, or do they vote their well-being and their changes in well-being? So one of the things that uh, I think politicians might take seriously uh, would be the case, which I, I believe will, may well happen, that people vote their well-being, uh, uh, partialing out economy. So you can actually ask the weighting of the voting of PERMA and changes in PERMA uh, versus uh, the voting of your economics and changes in economics. Uh, so in part of my, my memo to David Cameron was the question, uh, uh, if you hold yourself accountable for well-being changes in the British population, then uh, you basically want to see if uh, people will vote for changes in well-being. So, the hope, Dave, is that by changing the criteria by which we judge government from being does it making us wealthier, does it win wars, to also does it increase our well-being may, may make uh, real inroads into the, what's on the political agenda. I, is that what you meant by your question? It's certainly in the right direction. <laughs> yeah. You're arguing that we can change our personalities. Um, even as adults or even as older adults, that this is possible. And also that it's possible for us to create um, social and maybe some other kind of environmental uh, influences which would increase our well-being. But there's this uh, literature in psychology that suggests that um, adults' personalities are set by age 30 and that there's no more changes anymore. Um, well, we have Dave Featherman in the audience, I think. Dave, are you around here? Well, there are a large number of us who have come to believe over the last 40 years that adult personality can change and that there's good evidence for it. Uh, it's probably the case that on, on some forms of personality, childhood and adolescence is more important. Uh, but there, there is good evidence for, for change in adult personality. Uh, I, I, well, that's probably not, not a really good example, but uh, as I say, I take my own medicine, and at uh, age 58, I started to do all these things, and it was a huge personal change for me from being curmudgeonly and glum and the like to being uh, different. Uh, and I think there's a, uh, uh, evidence for that. So given that across the board there's change, I think the 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 psychological and institutional question is, how do we do things in, with parenting, in schools, in the army, uh, with adults that build the enabling conditions for uh, uh, PERMA and for the strengths that underlie PERMA? Yeah, thank you. The study that you are thinking of doing, which would involve Twitter, um, I'm not sure, I don't know, I guess I personally feel like Twitter wouldn't be the most reliable source right. of emotion from people. Right. 
So. Yeah. So, so <laughs> let me just explain some of the statistical tricks that okay. you can do. So imagine you've got the perma lexicon and you've uh, mapped uh, positive emotion for the northeastern United States, or better, for China. By the way, there are translation programs as well. Uh, for urban China on yesterday. So uh, Twitter users in China, they're, uh, they speak English, they have computers, they're rich, they're urban. What does that tell us about rural China? or people who aren't on Twitter and the like. So it turns out there are some very neat ways of answering that question. Uh, Root can probably tell you more, but uh, uh, one example, there's a yearly Gallup survey, uh, 200 nation survey, door to door, representative sampling of uh, 199 nations last time I looked. So uh, you can ask, and so they do rural China as well. So you can ask, what's the discrepancy between the Twitter factor and the Gallup survey? And then you put in compensating parameters in which you use to project. You validate this global Google flourishing against the door-to-door -door surveys that are representative. And you're able to do corrections, they're far from perfect, but you're able to make inferences about what a, 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 a rural Chinese would be on PERMA given that correction. So there are neat statistical ways of doing it that a lot of people in this audience uh, know how to do. Okay, thank you. So, could you could you give us some examples of your placebos? Because they, they'd have to be things that people would believe would work, even though ultimately they, 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 you didn't think they would work. Yeah, so uh, that's been a very interesting question. So we started the first time, and we had people write down three childhood memories. Uh, and it turned out that looked like a placebo. But then there were a bunch of exercises that we thought would work that turned out to be placebos. So I mentioned the signature strengths test. So uh, uh, we gave the signature strengths test and we told people to next week uh, use their highest strength to uh, carry out some task at work that was tedious. And uh, then we had one large group in which we said, just take the signature strengths test because we thought that merely becoming aware of what your highest strengths were would produce these effects. Well, it turned out to be a placebo. So it turns out in the course of this research, there have been about a half a dozen things that we thought would work that didn't. So we've got a surprisingly large number of placebos now. I have a friend who goes to Afghanistan, and um, I was thinking about your positive resources when you were speaking. and. Uh, just thinking that he might need some of those resources there. He might need to focus on uh, positive resources like happiness, for instance. And I think, you know, I think that what you do is uh, beautiful. At the same time, he goes there to kill people. So um, to me, even though he, he would have those resources, the whole enterprise is not very legitimate. And I was thinking also at, um, I was thinking at uh, the Florentine moment, and I, and I don't know, maybe, maybe you know, but the Medici's were torturing um, people, and uh, I think that Machiavelli was tortured um, by uh, one of I the Medici's. I didn't know that. Yeah. And um, I'm a little afraid that our moment I, points also in that direction. Good. Not I, I think I understand the question. Uh, and it's really an unavoidable question uh, in this domain. So let's say I worked on malaria and mosquitoes, and the United States Army was about to send troops to a malaria-infested area. Well, this would prevent malaria, but it would also make better soldiers. Uh, and so the decision one makes at the outset of this uh, is what you believe in. So there are two motives that I have in doing this research, and I think you, you recognize them full well. One is a mental health uh, motive. That is, we're sending 20-year-old kids in large numbers into harm's way, 
if we were sending them to a malaria-infested area, we wouldn't say, well, good luck when you come back with malaria, we'll give you quinine. Rather, we'd clear the swamps, give them mosquito netting, uh, and do uh, preventative stuff. But we've never done this with our young men and women before. So one of the aims of this is to decrease the amount of pathology that might occur. These are our future civilians. But the second is to make them better soldiers. Yeah. So that's undeniably part of this, and it's part of the Pentagon's motivation. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, I'm an American and proud to be an American. Uh, and so uh, uh, I, I, I uh, take great pride in both aims. I recognize we may differ about that. You mentioned a few methods that we could use to make ourselves, I guess, more positive, such as the three blessings and, um, you know, how we can use our strength to complete a task that we don't want to do. Um, what other things can you tell us about, you know, I guess, in the time we have to, that could also benefit us? Um, so there, there are uh, about a dozen that uh, uh, work reliably. And uh, uh, among them are uh, what we call a positive introduction, mm -hmm. learning to know what your signature strengths are, mm -hmm. and to uh, uh, narrate your life mm -hmm. in terms of your signature strengths. Uh, another the, uh, major one is the techniques of learned optimism. And there are several of those, but what they consist in uh, so uh, let me walk you through one. Okay. Uh, uh, so there's something called putting it in perspective. Mm -hmm. An important thing, uh, so we're bad weather animals, and when a setback occurs to us, uh, the normal response is to imagine the most catastrophic situation that might obtain. Uh, so uh, if you think about uh, the way your mind works in bad situations. It's a little bit like your tongue. So the default motion of your tongue is to swish around your mouth until it finds a cavity or something wrong with the gum. And then it sits there and it worries it. Worries it. Your tongue does not swish around your mouth and find a really good tooth. <laughs> and, and so, hmm, I'm going to spend my time. Well, I think there's reason to believe that mental life is like your tongue, and that generally what you're doing untutored is looking for what's wrong in your life and then making the most catastrophic interpretation. And by the way, this evolution has given you this. So uh, uh, the last great geological epoch that probably had an evolutionary influence was the Ice Ages. And those of your ancestors who said, uh, it's a beautiful day in Ann Arbor today, I'll bet it'll be beautiful tomorrow, got crushed by the ice. Uh, and the ones who said it looks like a beautiful day uh, today, but the ice is coming tomorrow, were the, that's what you got. Those are your, that's what your brain is about. So uh, first we recognize that people naturally make the most catastrophic interpretation. And so we put people through scenarios. Uh, in the Army, it would be something like uh, you sent your troops out on land orientation, and it's midnight, and, and one of the men isn't back. Uh, what's the worst possible scenario? And he, he's dead. He's lost. Uh, I'm going to be demoted. OK. What's the best possible scenario? So you, you now learn to do this. Well, uh, his, his, uh, he's probably 100 meters from here, and he'll be here in five minutes. OK, what's the most likely scenario? Well, it's probably that his radio died, uh, and he may be lost, but he'll probably be here by morning. So we teach people systematically to uh, recognize catastrophic thoughts and then put them in perspective. I noticed on your chart of nations that the ones at the top for flourishing were those Scandinavian countries who are known for their pessimism overall, sort of individually and culturally, I believe. And I've seen, I think there was a 60-minute segment about Denmark in which they were talking about how the Danes have the lowest expectations for everything in life of anyone in Europe. And, but they're always kind of surprised that things aren't absolutely terrible. They're just kind of terrible. I mean, that was what they were, they were saying. So I just wondered. 
if you could say a little more about how the optimism versus pessimism works related to flourishing. Uh, well, we have a real expert in the audience on this. Uh, Root, Root, are you around? You want to comment on the Danish paradox? Uh, why don't you come up to the mic? This is uh, Root Wienhoven, uh, 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 professor of epidemiology and sociology from Erasmus, who is actually the world's expert on your question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe my expertise is limited, but um, um, I don't know about low expectations in, um, in Scandinavia, and particularly not in, in Denmark. What I do know is that there is a slight general tendency that um, um, if you're very happy in a country, uh, that the chance that things are getting worse <laughs> is bigger than when it's miserable in the country. And that is a, well, a, a, a kind of coping mechanism that um, people in very miserable countries say it's miserable today, but it can't be miserable um, so long, so in the future it will uh, probably be better. And the question is whether that is uh, something at the personality level, uh, what Marty is talking about, or that it is more a superficial level uh, that uh, you see in the public discourse. And my guess is that uh, what you observe um, about the Danes, um, that it's uh, rather the superficial um, public discourse level. The, the, the Danish paradox is a severe one, so if, if I'm Correct me if I'm wrong, Root, but the average uh, unemployed Dane has better reported well-being than the average employed Frenchman. Uh, <laughs> Society today is very focused on wealth and success academically, like getting the good internships and getting the best grades. And, um, and for some of us here, it doesn't necessarily align with our own happiness. And so um, as much as we try to kind of um, run away from this societal pressure and try to pursue our own happiness, some this pressure is so great and it's so ubiquitous that you know, it kind of prevents um, some people like me from you know going after our own happiness so I was wondering what you have to say to that how can we you know just say okay I should do this rather than you know just well, follow this I, I think yeah. that's a really good question and that was where I started this afternoon so uh, I said that at a national level at a world level becoming conscious that people can flourish can have more positive emotion, more meaning, better relationships, more engagement, and more accomplishment, which by the way is the latter category, yeah. that all five of these things make a flourish in life, that people will, it will be on people's radar. Uh, so I don't have a magic bullet about how that's going to override, but I think by and large it hasn't been on our radar that uh, what it meant to live well, what it meant to live sensibly, was not only to accomplish, but to have, and not only to have lack of suffering, uh, but to have well-being. So I, I think uh, I'm talking about the, the possibility of changing our, our global radar screen to what is possible for human beings. So how will government that aims to increase people's well-being behaves differently from a government that aims to make people wealthier? First, a little bit should be said about the relationship of wealth to well-being. So it turns out statistically that if you look across all the nations of the world and within nations, essentially when individuals and nations are below the safety net, that increases in wealth produce in lockstep increases in well-being. But what happens when you get above the safety net is you get r rapid diminishing returns so that in the wealthy nations of the world, uh, say if the mean income in this audience is $80,000 a year, uh, an increase of $10,000 at that level does not produce much increase in well-being. So what does produce well-being over and above wealth? So what I've said is having more meaning in life. There's a way of creating institutions, education, in a way that what you're striving for is to belong to and serve ideals that you think are bigger than you. Better relations with people. 
So I gave the example of active constructive responding. Well, that wasn't just an example about what you do with a patient. It's an example of how we should conduct our lives. So enabling conditions that facilitate active constructive responding would increase well-being. Uh, we know quite a lot about positive emotion and things that increase positive emotion. Uh, and uh, uh, about engagement, uh, uh, if we look at engagement at work, then there's reason to believe from the Gallup people that two kinds of conditions at work produce more engagement. One is do you have a best friend at work? And second is do you get to do every day at work what you're best at doing? So that's just a sample of the kind of things that have very little to do with increasing wealth that increase uh, well-being. Um, I just want to say I, I too am a proud American, but I don't necessarily support everything the USA does. Yep. Um, and in, in particular, the wars we're fighting. And um, so my question is, um, how can we, uh, I, I'm wondering if this um, PERMA framework can take us away from um, seeing the negative things that are in the world and seeing our own shortcomings. Good. Really important question. Uh, uh, so positive psychology in its first five years uh, had kind of, it was like motherhood, got kind of uniformly good press. And then starting about five years ago, people started to make very interesting arguments against it. So one of the arguments was uh, from Barbara Ehrenreich, who uh, I, she wrote an article called I Hate Hope. And what she basically said in that article was if we teach people to be happy, they're going to become callous. They're going to not respond to the ills of the world. So happy people just don't look at what the awful things are in the world. So it turns out she was wrong. There are roughly 20 studies of altruism and philanthropy as a function of mood. And I think all but one I think 19 out of 20 was the last thing, show that happy people are more altruistic and philanthropic than unhappy people. Mm -hmm. And if you've worked with depression, as I have all my life, uh, it's obvious why. When, when we're depressed, depression is about self-absorption, that we start to filter the whole world through what's it doing for me. And when we're not depressed, we reach out to the world. So I think there are a lot of good arguments against positive psychology, and we'll hear some of them tomorrow in the seminar. But I think one of them is not that it will make us uh, 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 less altruistic and less caring about the world. Uh, I think the evidence is almost overwhelming that when people have well-being, they're better citizens. Some of the interventions that you uh, outline and some of the content appear to have strong overlap with some religious practice. Uh, can you speak to how you see that and whether various researchers have looked at people who practice and how they do these things do overlap? Yeah, so uh, uh, the M in PERMA is meaning, uh, and meaning as I process it is belonging to and serving something you think is bigger than you. That could be your family, it could be the environment, it could be the Democratic Party. But in this world, it's very often religion. Uh, and there's really quite good evidence, generally, that uh, religious people uh, in for well-being and depression probably do somewhat better. Uh, so uh, uh, here's uh, some data you won't like. Uh, no. Uh, so uh, one of my former students, Sheena Sethi, uh, went to the uh, 11 major American religions. Uh, we gave surveys, and she went to the Sunday school and coded the uh, optimism, the children's stories, the optimism of the liturgy, depression, and the like. Uh, and what she found in general was that the more fundamentalist the religion, the better off people were as far as things like depression and uh, uh, optimism went. So uh, 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 Orthodox Jews and Orthodox Catholics 
were uh, non-depressed, optimistic, happy. Reform Jews and Unitarians were depressed and pessimistic. <laughs> uh, and the mediating variable seemed to be hope. So the more you quantified hope for the future, uh, the, more, the better well-being you found. So that's kind of the state of the research on religion.